Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this professional learning opportunity, Integrating the Arts into the Elementary Classroom Part 2, Pom Poms and Puppets. I am Bailey Cornelius, the Digital Project Coordinator at NCEA, and I will be facilitating this webinar today. A few housekeeping notes as people are joining. We are recording this session. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A window. We'll monitor questions and try to answer them all in the allotted time. At the end of the survey, I'll share a link to the online survey in the chat and instructions on how to receive a certificate of completion for the webinar. Today's presenters are Dr. Jean Hearn and Dr. Karin Applegate. Dr. Hearn is an Associate Professor of Education and Director of Elementary Education Early Childhood Program and Chair of the Education Department at Creighton University. She completed her undergraduate work at the University of Georgia, her Master of Science in Education at the University of Omaha, and her doctoral work at Creighton University in the Doctor of Interdisciplinary Educational Leadership. Dr. Hearn has spent much of her career teaching in both public and Catholic elementary schools. Currently, she teaches both childhood, early childhood and elementary education method courses. Her passion lies in arts integration, early childhood education and teacher retention, all of which inspire much of her research. Karen Applegate is an Associate Professor and Elementary Education Program Director in the Department of Education at Creighton University. She was a classroom teacher for 15 years before earning her PhD at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Her research focuses on liter literacy methods for elementary pre-service teachers, racial li literacy, and culturally responsive sustaining pedagogy. She enjoys trying new recipes, growing plants, and spending time with her husband and eight mostly grown children. Before I turn it over to our presenters, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for all these men and women who have given their talents to educating our young people. Through the challenges they encounter each day, lead them to an ever deeper appreciation of the sacred duty to which you have called them. May they be people of integrity so that they can be witnesses as well as teachers. We pray that the schools they lead will become places where our young people can experience your love in their lives. Thank you for our Catholic schools. Help us to pray without ceasing, to work without wavering, and to give without grudging in order to ensure the future of Catholic education for all our children. We make this prayer through your Son, Jesus Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And with that, I will hand it over to Jean and Karin. Thank you, Bailey. Uh, we're excited to be here. I am Karin, and this is my friend, Jean. Yes, indeed. And the two of us are excited to talk to you today about integrating the arts into math, science, and language arts. Pom-poms and puppets. We have a little bit of both today. So thank you for joining us. Um, today, we're going to explore the use of the arts to enhance foundational math skills, science skills, and English and language arts skills. Um, Jean, do you want to give us a rundown of what are the arts? <laughs> so the arts, and, and I will say we're going to hopefully leave you with lots of lots of ideas. Oh, so many ideas. So yes. yeah, you have to chip. Okay. So the arts um, are what we consider the visual arts, painting, drawing, clay, sculpture, um, music, and drama, movement, and did I get them all? I think so. I think so. Poetry, storytelling, yeah. there's, a, there's yeah. a plethora of them. But, um, and we are hoping that we can inspire you to integrate those into your content areas, not just once in a while, but kind of on a daily basis as kind of a practice for yourself. And we hope you're going to do this because there's a lot of benefits to this. One of them is it's a great time saver. saver. Whenever you're integrating two things into one, you're saving at least half the time. Um, it also makes content much more engaging. And we'll talk about a little bit of that um, as we go along. Um, as well, instead of just hearing or seeing, which we often rely on for teaching, we're gonna be engaging all of our senses. So um, if we're doing that, I think you would find more ways to connect to things. And it also gives students many different ways to take in their content, but also to show you what they've learned. So we've said this word engaging already. Um, and so let's let's talk about what that looks like and what that means. So students who are engaged, that means that they love what they're doing. They're very actively doing it with you. Um, they're thinking about it. And when they're engaged, they actually um, 
do master content. Um, there's a lot of research behind that that says that the content that they're you're you're putting out with that arts integration is is mastered better. I guess on standardized tests and regular content areas tests. It also gets the brain involved, um, which which kind of headily talks about that hormone dopamine. And when you release that into the brain, you actually are kind of sitting, hitting the save button. So you're moving information, you're connecting it, and you're moving it into long-term memory. Great. We often, we probably can all think of examples of things that we've learned that um, because it was connected to a song we sang right. or um, well, the 50, actions that we did. Right. Oh, yes. The 50, 50 state song. Everybody remembers that oh, yeah. one. They, yes. can, they can all sing the 50 states. And uh, I always remember conjunction, conjunction, what's your function? Yes. So yeah. that we love, hopefully there's some people in our audience who are um, schoolhouse rock fans. Don't forget right. that's a great example of some music integration. And so research shows, as we've said, a lot of things that are beneficial about integrating the arts is that it individualizes learning opportunities actually because students will be drawn to certain ways of learning or showing what they learn that makes sense to them. And if you have many arts integrations, then you're kind of casting a wide net and you're certain to meet the individual needs of us different students, certainly um, less prone to classroom disruptions because everyone's hands-on, they're engaged, and so um, they're not bored, right? Right. Disruptions often happen when a student is feeling bored or um, things are becoming repetitive or redundant. So this kind of changes up what you're doing in the classroom. Um, and if you like school, you will come to school. So right. it increases your attendance rates. And uh, we do know there's a connection between higher standardized test scores. They just are like you said, hitting the save button and retaining some of the things that we're hoping that they catch in the classroom. Um, so with that, we're going to go into our presentation and talk to you about how to integrate the arts. We're going to start with science, right? And move on to language arts and end with math. So science is up first. So yeah, so science um, and the arts, I think we often, um, maybe we don't think of them, but they are kind of two peas in a pod. And we're going to talk about that um, in just a moment. So Let's you know, okay. let advance. So thinking in terms of both science and art, they are both highly, they, they use that, that observant, that skill of observation. And, um, and they're crucial, that that is a crucial part of any science project or any science experiment um, or any art project for that matter. You really do need to use that sense of observation of sight, but um, it also includes our other senses as well. So um, observing becomes more than just seeing, but you're also observing with your with your nose and with your ears and um, with your kinetic senses as well. And um, so science is also, and arts for that matter, both foster that critical thinking and creative problem solving. We talked about that the last time that the, if you weren't here, but one of the things that we noted was that creative and critical thinking skills are are super important. And today, um, research tells us that employers are looking for that skill more than any other skill. Yeah. So this is a, a is a way to really start to get those creative um, and critical thinking uh, and problem solving skills um, moving. Yeah, I've also heard it called flexible thinking, oh, you know, just being able to kind of look at things from a different point of view, to bend or change. And so and that certainly comes through the arts when we're right revising or looking like, oh, what color do I want to use next? What what song fits right. here? Those kinds of things. Yeah. And it 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 is all about ex exploration. Um, it's about, they're both about building connections with things, finding patterns, mm -hmm. discovering all the world around us. All of those things are represented in both that two piece as a pod type of thing. And it gives us those opportunities for that higher level thinking, which is so critical. Um, now and as they go through school and later on in life. Yeah. And so. you know, this also reminds me, Jean, in the Catholic schools and Catholic teachers, we we're always asking children to see the world God has created around them. And right. you begin to open up your senses and see the patterns in trees or the 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 music and sounds that are outside. You know, all of art and science are all around us. And that is a great opportunity in Catholic schools, especially to yeah. point that out to kids and kind of walk through the world going. God did this. Yeah, it's quite he amazing. Pretty amazing. So we have the same cycle in both of the this kind of inquiry cycle in both. So we like kind of gave you a, a 
look-see here of that, but you know, you can see you begin with maybe I see, I wonder, I think, and then you're going to be talking about um, how you're going to explore and investigate um, that phenomena, and you could do that both in science and in art. Then it taught we were talking about imagining uh, what you might do, proving what you might do, so you can discover more about it, and then you plan and you actually do it. You uh, and then you share that, and then after that, we are going to reflect and hopefully improve, listen to what others say. And of course, then we can make changes and um, and that's where we make some more connections and um, go back through the cycle again. So both do that, which is kind of cool. Oh, hang on, I'm gonna move to my next slide, there we go. So both science and the art do seem to emphasize what we would call a final product. You know, you're gonna do an experiment, you're gonna collect data, you're gonna learn from that or you do an art project and you hang it up, you look at it. Um, but I think that that's kind of um, oversimplifying things. I think that we have to consider that both, as we just saw on the last slide, rely a lot on the process and students, people in general, gain a lot just from, go from going through that entire process. And then after you reflect going through it again. So we, we, gotta, we can't underestimate the power of planning of that of investigation uh, where you've got those creative juices going because that is just has huge implications for education i think for life in general oh, yeah um it's all about the process right yes, it is it really is so we're going to tee up a video here and while karen tees that up i'll i'll talk a little bit about okay, it okay great i'll get it ready yep so i i love um showing you all examples and this is a wonderful example which um, I actually show in my my methods classes, and um, it I don't even have to sell it; it sells itself. So I'm going to let you watch it. But this is a gentleman who is a really uh, renowned scientist, and um, and he's going to use some some um, of the arts to help teach us an, a lesson about superfluids, which I'd never heard of. Super You'll never fluids. forget it. Okay, now you all are going to learn what superfluids are. are. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, here's the sound. Hang yeah. on. I'm going to pause. I think you, hear, you have an X. Oh, it's all the way up. Let me look at this one. Let's see, oh, that's why. Okay, I'm going to back it up. Thank you all. Technical difficulties often happen. Let's make 45. Sure. There we go. Works. Okay. It's perfect. Let's try this again. Superfluids, part two. Yeah. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> I come to you with a modest proposal for easing the financial burden. This idea came to me while talking to a physicist friend of mine at MIT. He was struggling to explain something to me, a beautiful experiment that uses lasers to cool down matter. Now he confused me from the very start because light doesn't cool things down. It makes it hotter. It's happening right now. The reason that you can see me standing here is because this room is filled with more than 100 quintillion photons, and they're moving randomly through the space near the speed of light. All of them are different colors. They're rippling with different frequencies, and they're bouncing off every surface, including me, and some of those are flying directly into your eyes, and that's why your brain is forming an image of me standing here. Now, a laser is different. It also uses photons, but they're all synchronized. And if you focus them into a beam, what you have is an incredibly useful tool the control of a laser is so precise that you can perform surgery inside of an eye. You can use it to store massive amounts of data, and you can use it for this beautiful experiment that my friend was struggling to explain. First, you trap atoms in a special bottle. It uses electromagnetic fields to isolate the atoms from the noise of the environment. And the atoms themselves are quite violent, but if you fire lasers that are precisely tuned to the right frequency, an atom will briefly absorb those photons and tend to slow down. Little by little, it gets colder until eventually it approaches absolute zero. Now, if you use the right kind of atoms and you get them cold enough, something truly bizarre happens. It's no longer a solid, a liquid, or a gas. It enters a new state of matter called a superfluid. The atoms lose their individual identity and the rules from the quantum world take over. And that's what gives superfluids such 
spooky properties. For example, if you shine light through superfluid, it is able to slow photons down to 60 kilometers per hour. Another spooky property is that it flows with absolutely no viscosity or friction. So if you were to take the lid off that bottle, it won't stay inside. A thin film will creep up the inside wall, flow over the top, and right out the outside. Now, of course, the moment that it does hit the outside environment and its temperature rises by even a fraction of a degree, it immediately turns back into normal matter. Superfluids are one of the most fragile things we've ever discovered. And this is the great pleasure of science, the defeat of our intuition through experimentation. But the experiment is not the end of the story because you still have to transmit that knowledge to other people. I have a PhD in molecular biology. I still barely understand what most scientists are talking about. So as my friend was trying to explain that experiment, it seemed like the more he said, the less I understood. Because if you're trying to give someone the big picture of a complex idea to really capture its essence, the fewer words you use, the better. In fact, the ideal may be to use no words at all. I remember thinking my friend could have explained that entire experiment with a dance. Of course, there never seemed to be any dancers around when you need them. <laughs> so while Karin te tees up our, um, our PowerPoint, um, he goes on to tell you that he, he, the beginning was, I'm going to save everybody money. He goes on to say that we don't need PowerPoints at all. He's going to save us a lot of money by not using PowerPoints. And uh, then he, he actually held a contest for different um, scientists to create different ways to teach their, um, their science. But I love that because I think it really does show us that you can use drama even for older people. Mm -hmm. um, I will never forget what a superfluid is. And I had absolutely no idea what it was yeah. at all. Yeah, it reminds me in our last video, we showed um, this children who were dramatizing the rotation of uh, the earth and the planets around the sun and how the earth tilted. And again, right. using um, dance to show that. So great way to bring in um, movement to science. Okay, now visual art. Yeah, well, and this is, yeah. So I wanted to kind of give you some ideas of how you could actually use some arts to teach science. So we have, uh, what is density? I had, I've had some people do this in my classes where they actually make this rainbow in a cup, a beautiful uh, art project there, but several, there's pictures of four different art projects and all of those show density, which is, um, so you can use art to show that. Uh, we've got the leaf, sketches or I guess those are etchings um, and rubbing, right? Yeah, rubbing, rubbing right, yeah, to, yeah. To show um, the different veins and what you, the different parts of the leaf. But then we also have down here a um, the solar system. And I know that I use, um, I have the kids actually create a earth, a moon and a sun. And then they have to get up and they take those and they move, they orbit around one another and they actually rotate while they're doing that. It's a fun, fun activity, but it really gets those definitions mm -hmm. um, ingrained in their, in their systems and connected. So we have to press that button again, where we can put it to our, um, put it to our memory. And then last I have a bubbles, bubbles are amazing. So um, he's using bubbles to kind of create art and also teach science. So I have one last video um, for you, and this uh, highlights science and music. Um, and this is a young lady who's going to start by, it's hard to understand her a little bit, but she's going to start by telling you she loves rap and, um, and science. And then the rest is pretty self-explanatory. Yep. I just thought to myself, hey, I like rapping and I love science. So I might as well put it together. Did you like science before this year? No. What, uh, what changed that? The all the music. And this musical method is not only getting kids excited and enthusiastic about science, but it's also producing real success in forms of test results. What does intrusive mean? And so our unit two test, we ranked number five, but our last test, we made our mark number one. Out of? 96 schools. Come with me. Yeah. Yeah. 
I can say that when Ms. McFarling took over in mid-September, that the children are always talking about science and they love going to her class and it's just full of joy. So yeah, it worked out well. Yes. So I wanted to highlight the word joy. She, um, and, and we'll, in our very last slide, going to talk about the joy it brings teachers, but um, kids are so joyful when you, when you incorporate the arts. And this is just but one example. Um, I have a couple other pictures there where I've had students make their own music. There's lots of where you can do vibration, um, pair that with um, this picture over here shows it pairing that with a piece of art artwork. And then you can use art um, to investigate different na natural phenomena. This, um, we have an insect that's actually crawling over a bone. You can't uh, see that, but that's a, a portrait that sits in a museum. Um, one of the things that my students have done is they um, have created for the Joslin Art Museum a, um, a rock treasure hunt mm -hmm. in the, and they go through the, it, for other students. So other students actually now use that to go through and find different rock formations in artwork. It's pretty oh. cool. It's amazingly cool. So they're looking at art hanging on the wall, for example, right. for examples of rock formations. Yes. And oh. they have, it's a whole uh, scavenger hunt. It's kind of like Indiana Jones. It's set, set, yeah. it's set in, a, in a, a situation like that. So it's really um, cool. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move from science now into language arts, reading, writing, learning to read and write. And um, we know that oral and written communication begins with play. And so in beginning to read, beginning to write, everything that comes before that is very playful and the arts are playful. So this is a, a great way to, um, we're going to be talking about some ways that art um, helps us play with words and sounds and learn to read and write. Um, it's present in almost all children's learning opportunities. Kids are always learning while they're playing. And it often is imaginative. And it seems as though imaginary play is ending earlier and earlier in the worlds of kids these days. So we're hoping to bring in some imagination into our ideas, you know, K through six. Let's yeah. continue to well, imagine. And older. And, and I mean, older. We just yes. saw some older ones. So Absolutely. We can definitely do that. Um, but really, foundationally, students need to practice their oral communication, talking with one another, understanding things um, in their linguistic development mm -hmm. before they are ready to move into concrete, written, symbolic things. And right. they begin to know. We know as children begin to write, um, they know that these scribbles mean something. They may not know what you know, what yours mean, but they can scribble and tell you oh, what yeah. their scribble means. Oh, for sure. Right. And that's just the beginning of written communication. And that's art, you know, and stories and pictures. Um, the child's ability to make these representations fosters higher order cognitive skills and really is the foundation for what they're going to need um, for their literacy yeah. development. So really visual art is at the very beginning. Absolutely. So, it yeah. starts with what we see and understand. So let's play in the arts. Okay. I'm going to play. Oh, you've got your puppet. I don't know. I hope you, if you all can see beyond the screen, we all have, we have our puppets and these are really cute and easy. These little gog googly eyes that you can put on your fingers are yeah. a lot of fun. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can use puppets and storytelling in language arts. And I have a couple of images here for some books you may be familiar with. Um, everybody loves the, the, uh, the pigeon books and, um, you know, he really wants to drive the bus. And the reason I put this one on there and uh, Nuffle Bunny is because there are some um, chat bubbles in these books and any books that have the chat bubbles, this is a great way to bring in some puppets too, to show what they're saying and let students begin to make that association between the, um, the bubbles and words coming out of someone's right. mouth. For older kids, this is knowing where to put the quotation marks, that's a really hard thing for kids to figure out. Right? I, you know, I used to teach fifth grade and I would have fifth graders who would put the conversation and then put said mom in quotation marks. Right. And so, you know, having puppets help them know the quotation marks come around the words coming out of a puppet's mouth. And, um, oh, have you seen my hat? Another favorite book. And the nice thing in this story is the dialogue is colored and coded. And so children who are able to read um, can easily move this book into a reader's theater or a puppet show yeah. because it's kind of already prepared um, for voices. So a few other connections I want to make here and I want to go through. I know as teachers, you might have a whole, some tools of your own, but jot down the ones that might be new or that you'd like to bring back to your classroom right. that you haven't used in a while. Um, 
Puppets are great for retelling stories, letting children be part of the retelling and sequencing events in a story. Kindergartners are working on what happened first in the middle and at the end, all of those kinds of things. Um, and then I really love puppets. I think they're essential in preschool, kindergarten, first grade classrooms for phoneme development. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to get my little puppet on again because... Um, and even older kids, this is kind of an interesting thing. If you have a child who is third or fourth grade and is really having trouble in um, sounding out words or developing their fluency, right. they may be, uh, they're most likely missing some phonological development. Right. And as a third and fourth grader, they really probably don't want to um, go back through the phonics and divide up words because that feels like kindergarten work, right? Right. So one thing that you might think about is having a third grader put on a puppet and work on segmenting, isolating sounds and blending sounds with the kindergartner. So right. they feel like they're the teacher, but in, in actuality, they're also reinforcing that skill for themselves. Right. And so you remind them again that we segment words and we might have our little puppet and we're going to segment cat. Ah. Eh and they can put a voice with it and know, and certain puppets might only be able to speak in phonemes, in right. segments. And so maybe my, if this is, um, my, this is my phoneme Phyllis and Phyllis can only speak in that way. They might have to say a whole sentence, breaking right. it up into say, mm, I, k, a, t, i, s, o, a, f, b. Okay. That's a lot, but that's how you would segment that. <laughs> and if third grader or a fourth grader who needs to practice their segment segmentation could do that with the kindergarten, isolating sounds, only doing the beginning sound or the ending sound and bringing in puppets to do that. And again, making puppets a friend who say, this is my friend um, who only can, only wants to know the middle sound or only looks, only likes words with a s right. sound. Let's find some words that what things would this person like or this puppet right. like? Saying vocabulary words, having Absolutely. your puppet say the vocabulary words or spelling words and have them spell, Absolutely. spell it to you. All of those um, right. Um, and rhyming, of course, is a lot of fun. If I have seen teachers who will have two of the same puppets and they will do rhyming words. And so the kids really associate it that rhyming words have something in common. Um, and the other thing that's really great is we know that reading and writing and all of these skills are cognitive, but they are also social because we learn to read and write to communicate. Right. We need others to do that. And our social and emotional development is also a part of all of this because we don't read a book to just say the words. We read a book to understand the theme or the mood or a character's evolving feelings. Right. And so helping our, um, having puppets to talk about how a character might be feeling in books and then moving that to personal, um, personal examples of feelings. Or It's really quite astonishing how open a child might be with when they think they're talking to a puppet. Yeah. How are yeah. you feeling? And just a teacher asking and a puppet asking, they may have two different levels. They feel very safe and comfortable. Um, it's also a great way to play out social scenarios in a classroom. Right. Things I have done that are it. happening on the playground. Beha yeah, behavior problems. Yes. They, they you make the puppets reenact it. Yes. And um, it's very interesting, the um, the solutions they can come up with. And you're right, they feel safe. Yeah. They are uh, much safer saying things um, from a puppet's mouth. Yes. And what advice will you give our puppet? Right. And so, again, this is oral language development. They are talking. You the vocabulary, but then also this might lead to um, some writing or other kinds of situations. Um, and so storytelling also in oral language options in our arts, Reader's Theater, which we're very familiar with, and there's just always new websites and opportunities out there to print stories. Um, Tableau is one of my favorites, and the pictures there on the screen are both of Tableau. And so having students, Tableau is a motionless picture using your body and your facial expression to show an image from a story or recreate yeah, a story. That. So um, you could, students might each be given a fairy tale and you might four or five say, okay, pick one scene that you think will give the rest of us a clue. It's a little bit like charades without the movement. So you can, you can be oh, a guessing like game. And so each group might get a fairy tale to um, put themselves into a tableau, a frozen image right. and others have to guess what it is based on what they're doing and what their faces are like or what part of a story if you just finish something nice. kids can pick their favorite part to tableau um other ways that we can bring in the arts that might be more 
oral and increase our storytelling would say it like, and this one is really acting. And this could be vocabulary words. It could be anything that you're working on and say, okay, say it like Cinderella. <laughs> say it like the Wicked Witch. Say it like um, uh, Homer Simpson. I don't know. Yeah. different. So letting them know that there are ways. So just acting out things that they are um, learning with right. different voices is a small way to tweak the learning. You can even do your math facts well, in a it, different voice. Right. Yeah. It, it helps with that perspective taking too. It taking does. someone else's perspective. Yes. You know. Um and, and spoken word poetry is just really great. And I put it on here QR codes because um QR codes are so it's a great way to capture student voices, student um what have I student talking about books, for oh, example. Yeah. And if you have students who are, they want to do a book review and they record it, then if you work with your school librarian to put a little QR oh. code in the library so when kids are going through, if they have an iPad to pick up, they can listen to a student's review of a book nice. or things like that. I have never done that. That's yeah. a great idea. So QR codes can be a lot of fun. They're also a way to link pictures of things students have done. It can be visual or audio. They can go home in newsletters each week, nice. listen to kids. And so um, I love QR codes. So if you can record something and then um, I, I usually use Google Drive to um, as a place where it lives, but then get a QR code to that. So others in the school, parents, nice. um, put them in the halls. Yeah. You know, one other kind of puppet we haven't talked about is um, shadow puppets. Oh, yes. I yes, love yes. I love shadow puppets because we have a lot of kids who don't want to make things because they're afraid it's not going to look great or, you know, it doesn't look yeah. like the teachers or the books. But the shadow puppets just have that outline. It's also a science thing. Yes. You know, it goes into yes. science with shadows. Because but. they have to figure out where to put the light so the mm -hmm. shadow of their puppet is on right. the screen. Oh, yeah. Super fun. Shadow puppets are fun. And you can use yeah. just a sheet yeah. and a, a stick with a figure on it. Yes. And a flashlight. And a, and a flashlight. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So now we're going to move into more of the visual arts using actual art, either that you are using or creating. Um, and I put in here that the, the key here is communication. We need to communicate to navigate the world. And really, um, the, the whole reason we're learning reading and writing is to communicate. But that is also the purpose of art. It is to communicate yep. something to an audience. And now each of us might take something different from what is communicated. But beginning to um, help students know that all artists have something that they're trying to share. And right. What is their message? What, what are you getting from this? What are they communicating to you? Um, my favorite, one of the, my favorite ways is to use um, wordless picture books with all ages of children. And yep. some are truly like Tuesday, um, this David Wiesner book is really written for upper elementary. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's um, a little bit of a um, sciency look at our earth and sustainability. Right. Um, so here are just a few of my favorite wordless picture books that can be used in the classroom. And the other there's so many ways that they can use the illustrations to write their own story, right. um, to just think about what the author's message is, all of these things. Yeah. Um, so I just I use that in kindergarten oh, because yeah. I showed them because a lot of kids can't write words in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So I use this to show them that you you can tell the story with just a picture. Yes. And then we move, um, you know, to writing one letter by the by the picture and then, you know, you move on from there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it's a great way to start. These are stories. Right. And, and yeah. Yeah. And Zoom is really fun. I actually have yes. two books of that. I tear it apart. I tore one of them apart. Yes. And I'm I give each each child one or two pictures and I have them put them in order without talking. Yes. It's very interesting. If you're not familiar with the book Zoom, it starts in on a tiny, it looks at a picture mm -hmm. and it keeps zooming out until you get the broader picture. Right. It's it's fantastic. It's fabulous. It's fabulous. Yeah. And I do book. I do that with my college students. Yes. Way, too. Yeah. And younger kids. Um, okay, this next one, I just want to take a second to introduce you to this amazing website. Write this down. If you are somewhere, you can uh, take a note. It's called Once Upon a Picture. It's um, out of the out of Great Britain, out of the UK, United Kingdom. I think they have cool things over there in the United yeah. Kingdom that we can <laughs> learn from. But this is, uh, I'm going to show you a quick trailer about the purpose of this website. Hang on, hopefully it doesn't start yet. And this will just take a second. Okay.
we have the sound on. I think you can do this time, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go to the website real briefly, and you'll, I just know you're going to want to explore this on your own later. Uh, I'm going back to my, oh, I think I just locked, I think I just went out of the Zoom. <laughs> Did I? No, no, here it is. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Somehow, oh, I know why, am I on full screen? Continue. All right. Oh, that panicked me. Here we are. Hello. <laughs> think we're okay. <laughs> All right. Back to, um, I'm going to show Just you. Just let you know we're real people. Oh, I know. Here we are. I have to find this. Um... So while you're doing that, yeah. um, I'll just, I'll advertise our last, our Thank last, you. our last, uh, our last little talk or presentation. We did, we did talk a lot about some of the whys and why this is important. We also gave a lot of ideas. It was about beach balls, but we gave other ideas too yes. about how you can use beach balls in your classroom. Um, so, okay. And okay. So I hope, um, Bailey, do I tell me, can you see this images to inspire? Is this coming up on the screen? Not yet. Here we go. I, there we are. I think I, that's what I did. I stopped my screen share. Okay. Now yep, can now we we've got it? Okay, yes. thank you. I'm sorry, everybody. Here we go. So this Images to Inspire is all about using art to inspire kids to write, to think. And my favorite part is over here. If you look at the collections, and this is going to be really tiny, so I'm going to just, um, for example, they have the character collection. And this one, they have a character and you show it to kids. And there's a whole, there's just dozens and dozens. And then they have these, um, you, first you show the image without the title, this one prompts. Who do you think this is? Why is he carrying all those jars? Why is he wearing this clothing? Just really imaginative oh, thinking yeah. about art. And then um, you share the title and ask some more questions, but there are lots here to talk about character and how characters are developed just in the images that we right. see here. Um, what do you notice about this room? What is familiar to you? What is unexpected? What do you think is happening? Um, so this is great. My The one that I really love, there's the fiction collection. The inference one is the one I love because inferencing is something we teach kids in comprehension and in right. text. And this one allows you to kind of look at pictures and practice inferring and thinking about the emotion in the picture. Um, how is this girl feeling? How do you know? Why do you think she might be feeling this way? Again, these could become stories. Right. These could be prompts that invite storytelling. Yeah, and I was I was telling you the other day that I heard someone talking about giving a piece of art and then having kids either write, is this at the beginning of the story? Is it the middle of the story? What would happen at the end? So it was kind of interesting yes. the way they used the uh, art for writing. Yes, so I... Um, really uh, there's one that's all about predicting and so practicing some of these comprehension skills with art and the and, and everyone's ideas are correct right right there's no right and wrong answers i love this website good and i've so never seen it it's fantastic have. so um i just wanted to be sure and, and share that with everybody so i'm going to go back to our slideshow full screen there we are okay and then I think the la my last couple are about creating art and painting, drawing, sculpting, collaging. Is that, mm -hmm. I made a new word. I can hear Carla. That. Yes, you can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Carl is a collaging person. Um, and artistic representations of setting, theme, mood, making character collages. 
um, deciding what things symbolize this character, what might they like? If they went shopping, what would they buy? You know, those kinds of things. Um, Reimagining context and scenarios of stories. So what if um, Cinderella lived in a city? What if um, the big bad wolf was framed and the three little pigs were, you know, there's a good story yeah, about that, by the way. Exactly. Yes. Um, and then creatures and superheroes are also a wonderful um, thing for kids to create and make stories right. about. Um, so I, I wanted to be sure. And then here are some um, others. Music, again, goes well nicely. Um, one idea I think is really fantastic is for kids to read, especially older kids, read reviews of some of their favorite songs that come out. You can read online what people are saying, find some musical reviews and see what they think and then write their own because this right. is great persuasive language oh, yeah. and argumentative language. Um, creating playlists that, um, what do you think this character would listen to, right? What's the playlist you would listen to while that would go with this book? Right. Um, those kinds of things. Classical music is an oldie, but a goodie. No pun intended, they are old. Classical is kind of, there's new classical music too. But having kids listen to classical, classical music and decide what season is this? What right. mood does this convey? Um, don't forget Schoolhouse Rock, vocabulary raps, the vocab vocabulary site is awesome. Um, instruments, I put a picture over here, using instruments when you're doing phoneme segmentation and blending, Love make that. sure you bring it in. Um, rhythm for poetry, if you're reading poetry and it has a rhythm or rhyme, having instruments to right. go with it. Um, and using song lyrics as prompts for writing or reading them as a story. Yeah. So um, I put Joyful Noise on there because that poems for two voices, that's an old, I bet that was in the 80s that that book came out. Right. And we still love it today, having kids take turns reading and read together. It really is music with their voices. Put a few uh, book recommendations on here. That um, This new one by Amanda Gorman, who was our um, youth poet laureate. I think 2020. Um, Change Sings is a beautiful story about how each each of us kind of brings an instrument to the song of freedom. Oh, I like that. And My Mama is the Work of Art. This is a brand new book that's a lot of fun. And this little boy begins to appreciate the artistic qualities of his mother who has tattoos from head to toe and how she's chosen them and how that really um, it, it is her expression of art. Oh, wow. And it's a it's a great book. Harris, The Mysteries of Harris Burnick is an older one. It, lends itself to what you were saying about there's a picture and you decide which part of the story it is. Right. Um, Hoops is a um, a great poem that's set with illustrations about basketball. Um, and the vocabulary is fantastic. Okay, your turn. Oh, we talked good. a long time about language arts. That's Sorry. okay. We, and yeah, you might realize she teaches the methods for re reading language <laughs> arts and I do math and science. You're a great, yeah. We're still good. We have yeah. about 15 minutes. Okay, okay. good. All right. Well, I, I, we can talk pretty fast here, but um, I, I wanted to just kind of mention that integrating um, math and art kind of seems like oil and vinegar because we've got this right side of the brain and this left side of the brain, creativity, logic, people don't really think they go together. You think you're either analytical or you're creative. And um, we know now that that's not true, but, um, and in having both and developing both is really important. But I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, it should be mixed, I guess is what I'm saying. You need to mix them because um, the arts are a wonderful way to, to teach math and make connections. Um, we use a lot of visual solving, uh, visual art and problem solving that that's a good link there. Um, also, we know that both require reasoning. They both require spatial perception, observation, arranging, patterns, classifying. Um, and of course, we go back to the shape, symmetry, portion, proportion, and measurement to all those things are math. Um, Geometry is art. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is, absolutely. Um, so, but we, all, we often think that um, in art, there's only one way and, and in math, even there's just one answer, but, um, or art has a lot, I guess I should say that wrong. Art has lots of different possibilities. Yes. Math has one answer. Yes. But I'm saying that wrong because actually that's incorrect. We now know that there's a lot of ways to get to a problem. So you can, there's many strategies. There's, there's usually one algorithm you end up with, but, um, there are many strategies. So it's much more like uh, math is much more like art than we really think. Yeah. And uh, we really want our kids to be looking at problems from different viewpoints and approaching 
problems to the problem solving from different angles. Yeah, which is like the math talk in classrooms. Right. Like how can right, you make right, money? Right. right. There's lots of ways. Lots to make of ways money. to make. Yeah. Got it. For sure. And when you when you come at it from that direction, and kids really get that foundation, they get that foundational knowledge, and that builds um, that great foundation, even when they have the algorithm um, back for when they go problem solving, especially like in standardized tests and stuff. Um, so also when you start young with art, you actually are building this great foundation for later concepts. So this is an example of where you've got students using artwork to make arrays, um, but they, they later use that and that foundational knowledge that transfers to powers and exponents. So, um, and there's a lot of different ways to get at that, but I think it's important to know that when you're creating this, using this art at the beginning, you're actually setting kids up for success later. Yes. And there's a high correlation with learning music early and oh my skills, God, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so here are just some examples of ways to use uh, math and visual arts. Um, we've got the obvious, um, I guess those are, what are those pieces? No, they're, oh, uh, yeah. uh, no, I can't, the, the name is escaping me, but here's a wonderful way to do it. You look at that and you say, what? Tangrams. They're right. not, they're not tangrams, but, Something else. Okay. Yeah, but tangrams are a certain different shape. But at any rate, you look at this and you say, what, uh, what fraction of this is red? And the kids have to, they can use pieces. They lay them on top of one another. It's fascinating. And they can, they actually, they can yeah. do it, Yeah. but it's really cool. But there's a lot of other things you can do with that. You could take out all the lines and, and say, you make this in 20 pieces, or actually probably you do a smaller one than that. But there's a lot of different ways you can use those to help with problem solving. We've got a symmetry example here um, using a painting. Um, and then we also have uh, using graph, graphing and graph paper um, coordinate planes, those type of things. And then in early childhood, you can use, this is that pom-pom piece. Pom-poms, yay. Yeah, so you can use those as you um, can create the numbers and, and it's a wonderful way, a tactile way for them to get those in their memory. Um, so then music and math, we've got, um, you mentioned um, music, music, learning to play music, but it's also, uh, if you think about it, that's actually fractions mm -hmm. in play. So it's kind of fun to, uh, you can teach fractions with that. Um, you can actually, there's a picture there in the middle where you're actually using those as uh, math problems, as a code kind of. Um, and you can, um, it, it's just, there's so many ways to songs that that teach the rap songs that we talked about. There's plenty of rap songs, vocabulary, folk, flow vocabulary. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that we can connect. I was just looking up because I have a student who's student teaching in kindergarten and they are using something called Tune Trains. It's an app oh. and they it combines and the kindergartners loved it. They when I walked oh, in wow. the room, they were running up to me with their iPads That's and fun. Tune Train. It's mixing coding and music and they could write songs by telling the like whether they wanted the note to go up or down. So they were doing coding. And then in the end, they had their own little song. Oh, I love that. It was great. Tune Train was the name of it. Um, and I can, it, yeah, very good combination of music and math. A lot of co uh, connections with math and drama. And you can use this for, um, like there's a picture of a store so they can act out the store, okay. pricing, menus. Oh, there's any number of ways you can do that. But also... Um, you can have um, kids act out their story problems. So they come up and they uh, actually act those out with their bodies. Um, then you you can do all kinds of things with numbers and different puppets, which we've talked about somewhat, but um, there's many different ways to use drama to uh, help get that deeper into the brain, get that dopamine going. Yeah. And then movement. Um, we see here, we have people that are actually using um, big rubber bands. Those are easy to make, by the way. You can just buy big elastic and tie them together, but they're using that to make shapes, um, yeah. different shapes with their bodies. Uh, make a quadrilateral, make a, you know, yeah. you know, work with the partner to, you know, make a parallelogram. I don't know, you can do any number of things. And then you've got, you know, this is a number mat. Again, easy to make. You can buy a big, a really cheap shower curtain with a ruler and a, a Sharpie, make yourself several of these things, but there's lots of different um, things you can do with a large mat um, for your students. And we have someone using their kinesthetic. They're, they're actually counting um, 
they're counting little pom-poms, putting them in a little with with tweezers. So that's for younger kids that gets that fine motor. Sure. And you can use an egg carton, I can imagine, in yeah. any way to move them. Yeah. yeah. And then we've got the um, beach ball, which we talked about last time a lot. Yep. So catch yep. those. Catch it and solve the problem under your thumb. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You Jean, you know, you, will you be happy and joyful while you're teaching with the arts in your classroom? Yeah, I am. I We're going to, to hope um, that as you got some ideas today that you find one or two or 10 that right. might bring some joy to your kids and to you. It's more fun to teach with right. arts well, and there's used lots methodologies. Of, lots of research yes. behind that. Um, it helps pedag pedagogically. Yes, uh, it has advantages for that, but it also uh, in in the benefits do outweigh the work. That's actually one thing that came out in the research, which was kind of funny. Um, but I, I think teachers have to think about the work that they're, you know, we we have a lot to do. So um, yes, so I think it's worth it the effort. Um, and then um, it does help with this teacher self image, and it helps them to, teachers to feel this sense of camaraderie. We have a great camaraderie mm -hmm. um, and self assurance. And then it also enables uh, you to reach more learners. Yeah. Yeah. So bringing them all in. Well, thank you so much for coming to our webinar today. We've really enjoyed coming live from Creighton University. Mm -hmm. Yes. Here in Omaha, Nebraska. It's a nice sunny day here. It I is. I don't know what it's like other places, but um, if you would like more information, this is Jean's book, Integrating the Arts into the Everyday Classroom. It's a fantastic book with lesson plans and ideas, could be fun to share with colleagues. So please use the QR code there if you would like more information about integrating the arts into the Everyday Classroom. And I also have a QR code if you are someone who is interested in working on an online master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a several certificates available all online at Creighton. We have an early childhood cohort starting in the fall. So we're accepting applications through um, mid-June. If you are interested, there's something there. If you've- A good complete... scholarship for people who are teaching in Catholic schools. Absolutely. Right? Great, so. great um, scholarship rates for uh, Catholic school right. teachers. And if you complete two certificates, um, early childhood being the first, and then you could choose a second, you have a master's yeah. degree from Creighton University. ESL, yeah. um, teacher leadership, Catholic school leadership. You pair those with and Something. sports leadership, right? Yeah, and two things make make a master's. Panera, pick two master's degree. Yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for yeah. taking uh, time out. I know you. We know teachers are working hard and you're busy. So thanks for joining yeah. us. Yeah. If there's any questions, Bailey will let us know. You can type them in, but to the yes, chat. We've got a few more minutes for questions. I'll wait a little bit to see if anybody has questions. And if not, I will close us out. Um, Jean, if you have anything else you'd like to say while we're waiting. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we covered it. Thank you, Bailey. Yeah. Well, it seems like there are no more questions. So Great. I will say thank you for attending today's NCEA webinar. NCEA continuously strives to improve the quality of our services for our members based on feedback. We will use your input to inform future work and improve services. The survey that I've already dropped into the chat should take about five minutes to complete. If you are interested in a certificate of attendance, please include your email address and name at the end of the survey. Since your certificate will be sent via automated email, please check your spam if you do not see an email within a few minutes. Arn and Jean, thank you so very much. Everyone else, thank you for attending. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Bye Thank bye. you. God bless.